say what's up to you, man at church, wherever you're joining us from along the military highway. I want to welcome everyone in Newport News. I got to shout out our microsite in Fort Johnson, Louisiana. That's Mana in the Bayou. Uh, we also have Mana Church joining us in Fort Greg Adams, Virginia. We're down in Virginia Beach. We have Mana Church in Williamsburg, Chesapeake. We're even in the city of New York. We're in the city of Pennsylvania. Well, that's a state actually. Bangladesh, the Republic of Korea, and the USS Roosevelt. We're so glad that you're here. And if you're new here, hi, my name's Riley. Uh, let us know where you're tuning in from, right there in the chat or in the comment space. Our team would love to uh, send you a free gift. We love to bless all of our guests, guests with a free gift. Just something practical from Man of Church to say thank you for joining us today to worship Jesus. And uh, you picked a great time to join us, so it's St. Patrick's Day, so that's fun. I wore this green jacket, so I won't get pinched, um, or anyone pinch me or send me like a shamrock emoji. I wore my green to play along with what we're doing in our society, because societies are just so interesting. Um, you know, art or music, language, politics, all these things get influenced by people. Um, people change and so societies change and I think that's where the challenge for me, uh, the challenge for all of us who follow Jesus, uh, what do we do when the things around us seem to be constantly changing? How do we stay authentic? How do we stay tethered to truth and follow God? Um, which is why, thankfully, he gave us his word. We have the Bible. We believe the Bible's the handbook for life. And so as we look at relationships, as we look at our purpose, our original intent, even our identities, those get informed and shaped by the reality of who God is. And so what we've been doing for the past four weeks today is we've been in a series that we've called Parenting on Purpose. Um, it's not just about raising kids. Um, it's about raising you. You're God's favorite kid. He's your heavenly father, and he wants to parent you. Um, he wants to do that on purpose. You're not a mistake. You're not an accident, and he has plans for your life. And um, if you're catching up, you can always go back on our YouTube channel to revisit all of the talks we've had about being an individual. We've had talks about relationships in general. Um, last week, Tasha was sharing with me on the topic of marriage, and today we're going to talk about work. Um, like your job, your J-O-B, where you go to pick up God's provision. Um, but before we jump into our content for today, just a quick reminder um, about the Bible. If you've been growing up in church um, and now you're growing up in Christ, or maybe you've never even opened the Bible, maybe you don't know a lot about Jesus, um, the Bible is so different from any other book you can experience. Um, it's actually a collection of documents, 66 documents that were inspired by God, written by people, handed down to us. Um, and, and so when you read scripture, you can't approach it like it's a history book or a science book or, you know, just a book of poetry. Now, it has all of those things, but the Bible is so much more. And so I just want to encourage you, when we approach the scripture that even we're going to study today, we have to go into scripture knowing that we are experiencing God, um, that there's a, a download that we expect for him to breathe something as we examine what he was saying to people in their context, and then we mine the application and the principles to apply to ours. Um, and so if you're taking notes, um, our talk for today is how to do work. Um, God created you for good works, and when you open the Bible right there in Genesis, we see that before God gave Adam, the man, Eve, a woman, he gave that boy a job. Um, so fellas, if you're looking for the girl, get a job, be about your father's business, he'll bring you a girl. Um, so let's jump into the text right here, um, Genesis chapter 1, verse 28, which says, and God blessed them, talking about man and woman, Adam and Eve, humanity. He blessed humanity and he gave to them, or he said to them this command, be fruitful and multiply. Fill the earth and subdue it. Now we talked about, you know, some of the benefits of marriage, this gift of human sexuality that God created for the covenant of marriage. Um, that's where the be fruitful part's going to come. Um, so we're going to talk about raising kids next week. Uh, make sure you come back for that. Uh, but I want us to camp on this subdue part. Subdue the earth and have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the heavens and over every living thing that moves 
on the earth. And the word that I really want us to get here, it's a Hebrew word, uh, the word for subdue. Um, I used to do a little bit of like, I, I try to do some mixed martial arts, some Brazilian jiu-jitsu. And so when I think of subdue, um, the word kabash, that's the Hebrew word there, it means to bring under subjugation. It means to submit forcefully. So it, it's almost like God was giving Adam and Eve a heads up that I've given you this role to get dominion, to expand my kingdom influence here on the earth, but not everything, hint, this little serpent that's in the garden, not everything is going to willingly submit to the authority I've given you. So that means you're gonna to need to subdue it. You're gonna to have to take it by force. We know that the kingdom of God is forcefully advancing and it's forceful men, forceful people who lay hold of it. And in Genesis, right here, we see this ancient rhythm, evening, morning, rest into work. Uh, I was even doing a little bit of journaling. Uh, so I brought my journal, you can't see this, uh, but I encourage you, like sometimes when you read the Bible or when you're praying, get a pen and a pad and write those things down. Journaling helps you slow down. Like my brain, I drink a lot of coffee, so I'm usually like a thousand miles per hour. Um, what I've learned is that journaling forces me to slow down and hear from God. And as I was preparing for this series, I was writing about, okay, so there's, there's a healthy place of rest. I think what the enemy likes to do, um, if there are three categories of like being the sluggard, Proverbs talks about the sluggard, the lazy person, um, that leads to gluttony, it, it leads to overindulgence, too much of too much fun, too much pleasure. So you don't want to be there. Um, and I think then we try to overcompensate and so in America, you know, we have hustle culture. That's what society says, grind. Like even Rihanna says, work, 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 work. I'm like, how much work do I gotta do in order to be a productive human being? And so we get busy, we start striving, we start grinding. And in those two places, if you're lazy, the enemy's robbing you of tomorrow because you're not expecting things from God. You're not building things that will last. You're not building that legacy. At the same time, if we're just busy, um, that's one way the enemy tries to rob us. By keeping us busy, if we're so busy grinding, then the enemy's robbing us of today and even of yesterday of reflecting and enjoying what God's already provided. Um, so then there's this sweet spot that I like to call rest. Um, this is where you're moving at the pace of grace. You're not a sluggard, you're not striving, but you're in stride with God. Jesus says, come follow me. We call this walking with the Holy Spirit, to do life with him, and that's what we wanna camp out on when we talk about work. It's the reality that God has created us to be with him, so that's the point. Your goal is to be with Jesus. At the same time, if you're with him, he also calls you to do good works. And so that's the tension, that's the tandem. It's Mary and Martha. I'm gonna sit at his feet, but I'm gonna keep the house clean. Um, and there's a, a give and take there. Obviously we do that as the Lord leads us. But what I don't want you to miss is that work is a vital part of what it means to be a child of God. Uh, we're called to mature. Like there is a family business and God has you strategically placed in the place of your work. Um, and like we've done, with every message this series, we re-examine Genesis. So you go to the principle of first mention, you go to God's original design, and then we're gonna jump to some letters in the New Testament, some guidance that we get from the Apostle Paul as he's shedding light, as he's revealing more of these ancient rhythms that God gave us. And so let's go to Colossians. Um, this is gonna be in Colossians chapter three, verse 23, where Paul's instructing this church, he says, whatever you do, and cool thing about the Greek word whatever, it applies to whatever. Whatever you do, cleaning the house, going to work, commanding your unit, getting your degree, playing on your team, whatever you do, work heartily as for the Lord and not for men, knowing that from the Lord you will receive the inheritance as your reward. You are serving the Lord Christ. And when I look at that, instantly this the, the language here the emphasis of the lord christ it's the one place where paul uses this language um, a lot of scholars um, pose the idea that he's using this to help 
human beings understand that, hey, I know you have a boss, or maybe you are the boss, but even if you're the boss, you have a boss. Um, there, there is a Lord, there is a master that you're accountable to. Um, he, he is going to expect things from us, again, not for our salvation, but from the reality that we are his kids. And, and so when we work, we're working for Jesus. Whatever you do, um, the, that word heartily or heartily, um, there's a Greek word cardia. Um, here at our site in Newport News, we actually have an academy that we've started called Cardia Christian Academy. And that word means heart. Um, but like cardiac, so it comes from that Greek word cardia, like that's where we get cardiac arrest. The word that Paul's using here, however, isn't that type of heart. It's the word psyche. It's, it's where we talk about the soul, your, your profile, like how you're wired, your mind, your will, your emotions. That makes your psyche, that's the heart from with which we need to work. And so when we know that we work for God and not ourselves, this changes how we go to work. Maybe I don't like my boss. Maybe I'm not the best boss and I need to treat people better. Now that I know I'm accountable to Jesus and how I lead my company, I'm accountable to Jesus and how I behave in the courtroom, that should inform how we treat people. That's really what these relationships are all about. They're the litmus test, if you will, of how tethered we are to Jesus. And so Paul drives this point home here that it's our Heavenly Father that we work for, and it's for His pleasure. Uh, if you look at the Hebrew word for work, it's a word called avda, it's the same word for worship. And I don't know about you, but like I, it took a while for me to start seeing my work as worship. Um, maybe you think as a pastor, that's kind of easy. Um, I will tell you it's easier said than done. Um, it's easy to get into the nine to five rhythms of any job. It becomes a little redundant. It becomes a little mundane. And we can miss out on a worship experience. Worship experiences aren't just what we do on Sunday morning. We need to gather corporately for worship. We need to gather in microsites for worship. But then when we go to work, Monday through Friday, hopefully you take a day off somewhere in your rhythm, you rest into work, and that's worship that we're giving back to God. Which leads us to our first principle. Um, if you're taking notes, write this down. You are an employee of the kingdom. Um, so welcome to Job Orientation. Uh, my name is Riley, and I will be your HR manager for the next 15 minutes. Um, that's kind of a joke, but that's what we get to do as, as pastors, is we're helping God's employees perform better on the job, grow into His image, His character, His likeness, and to advance His kingdom here on the earth. And, and so when we live with the kingdom in mind, when we live honestly with eternity in mind, that changes how we work. So now I'm not just going to work to earn a paycheck. I'm not just grinding to get to the one day dream job that I've always wanted. No, I'm gonna rest in today, knowing that today may be the only day that I have. And so Lord, here's what you've given me, and I wanna give it back to you with a return on investment. And, and so how do we then act as kingdom employees? Are we thinking about the kingdom's reputation? You know, maybe if you're operating in this lazy category like I've been there there's some days I'm like yeah I just want to phone it in I just want to do the bare minimum we, we know that person or that classmate someone who always shows up late they want to leave early what does that say about the God you worship um, they're just a different standard it, it's a testimony that's the best sermon you can ever preach it might be how you go to work each and every day um, and again the whole idea of provision we know God's the provider that's who our Father is. He provided everything we need for righteousness, for godliness, is all provided for us. And so when we work, we're simply picking up His provision. It's the vehicle He's chosen to use to provide for us. So how do we represent Him and, and stand for truth? Um, I think our next application helps with that. The, the next thing I want you to write down is you may have to change your perspective. Your perspective on work might need to change. It can't just be this 
side hustle. It can't just be the thing that leads to the thing. You're an agent of the kingdom and how you act matters. It absolutely matters because your soul, again, not just your passion, we're talking about your mind. So the way you think about the job God's given you is shaping you for eternity. Your will, your desires, I've always wanted to be this. Well, what if God didn't want you to be that? Did you go through the process of praying and talking to him? Have you talked to your spouse if that's the season you're in? Have you talked with your kids about this next great venture that you feel God's leading you on as a family? All those are indicators of helping you discern his plan for your life. And so we have to change our perspective, y'all. If I can be a little preachy, so Tasha ain't here to hold me back <laughs> from going all in on this point. Um, there's a difference between calling and assignment. The calling, so the calling for every Christian is you are called to Christ. He asks us to do some simple things. Go, make disciples of all nations, baptize them in the name of the Father, Son, Spirit, teach them to obey all that I've commanded you, and you're good. Why? Because I'm going to be with you. So we're all, if you're following Jesus, we are all called to go and make disciples. That's how we advance his kingdom here on the earth. You want to push back darkness? You take someone who's in darkness away from darkness. And you win them for the team of light. You win them for the kingdom. That's the calling, no matter who you are. The assignment can be as a janitor or as a special operations airman, or as a church planter, or as a CEO, or as a commander of a military unit, or a college student, or a middle school student, high school student, your assignment may change. Your calling is always to Christ. And so lean into that reality. Like, I've navigated that all throughout my journey with Jesus. Yesterday, I had hoop dreams. I wanted to be a professional basketball player. Uh, I made it to D3 in college and found out, eh, well, this assignment's over. Um, God's taking me somewhere different. And then I enlisted in the Air Force. And I'm like, okay, we're going to do this until we retire because um, I'm all in on what God's asked me to do. And then along that journey, at year 11, God said, I want you to be a pastor now. He changed my assignment. So today I, I get to be a, a pastor. Tomorrow, I don't know who I'm going to be. But what I'm going to do is follow the one who's calling me whenever he asks me to do something. I'm going to obey him. And that's a process that all of us are in. Um, which brings us to this next point. Um, you are at your job for yourself and you're at your job for others. So yes, my mom used to <laughs> remind me of um, this old hunting phrase, or I guess it's like a farm phrase. I didn't grow up on a farm, so I'm probably misquoting this. Uh, but the phrase was, if a dog don't work, he doesn't eat. Um, it was this idea that, hey, even if you are a pet in the family, you need to generate something for the family. And I think the thing is so true for us. Like, yeah, we need to work. We, we, we can't just sit around waiting for change to come. Well, God invites us to be a part of that change. Just think about Moses with this Red Sea right in front of him. Lord, what are we going to do? He says, stretch out your hand, Moses. Again, faith is an action word. It implies faithfulness. What are you doing but what God's giving you to steward? At the same time, that benefits us, but we also should benefit others. And so I, I get it. There are all different types of personalities. Um, I, I get it. if you're an introvert, if you're an extrovert, wherever you are, you're called to help someone else. And so maybe when you go to work, see that as your mission field. Especially if you've always been called, oh, I just want to go to this country and, you know, maybe I just got to retire from my job or I got to make enough money to one day free myself up to do the one thing I feel called to do. But then you miss today. The enemy's robbing you from tomorrow or you're, you're missing out on this moment you have to reach that person that's in the cubicle. Do people even work in cubicles anymore? Probably not. On the Zoom window with you or in that part of your business that's in another state or your classmate. You, you get the point that there are people who need to encounter the presence of God and the closest thing they might see to Jesus just might be you. So you work for your benefit and the benefit of others. And here's another application point I want us to have. The Lord placed you on your job. So trust him. 
Um, I, I love this about our God. Um, he, he's the same God who takes a young man, Joseph, who's kind of supervising his brothers, and then he gets trafficked in some of the most horrible circumstances that I could imagine. Then he gets promoted and, and, and placed in charge of a, a high official's home. Then he gets sent to prison for something he didn't even do. And from that spot, he gets promoted to be the second in command of the largest, most powerful nation on the planet at the time. Who gets the glory in those type of stories? God does, because only our God can do those things. And so if he's placed you there, just hang on to the hope that there must be a reason. Maybe he's got you placed somewhere that you don't want to be. If you don't have one of these coffee mugs, we'll send you one. You were made on purpose for a purpose. Your life isn't a mistake. The fact that you're in that family, at that school, in that job is not a mistake. God wants to use you. And sometimes when he's using you, you can feel used. And so that's when we need to pause and reflect and know that, okay, God, maybe you're doing something bigger in this moment than I can even dream or imagine. Uh, this is really a life verse for me. You're going to hear this until Jesus comes back to get us, all right? As long as I get to preach, you're going to hear Proverbs 3, 5, and 6, which says, Trust in the Lord with all of your heart. Remember, heart, soul, mind, will, emotions, your psyche, all of who you are. And do not lean on your own understandings. I know you're so smart. You're not smarter than God. I, I know you're analytical, trust me, like I used to do intel. I always try to figure out what God's doing and he laughs at my plans for my life. And so he humbles me to not lean on my own understanding but to do what? In all of your ways, acknowledge him. That's the same knowing, the intimacy we see with Adam and Eve, that's the intimacy God designed for you to experience with him. In all your ways, acknowledge him and he will make your path straight. God has good plans for us, and so we trust him, and we lean into him with all we've got. And honestly, we couldn't lean on ourselves in the first place. I think trust in its purest form, again, having walked this out in work environments, having walked out trust in, in my marriage, having walked out trust as a parent, um, trust means you surrender or you relinquish control. Um, there's an exercise like trust falls, like you might drop me. Yeah, that's the chance you take. But if you trust the person, you're willing to take that chance. And y'all, our God is trustworthy. We can absolutely trust him. We're always safe, even when it doesn't feel like we are. So I just want to process this with you for a couple of moments. Like maybe reflect on these questions as you're journaling or reflect on these questions in your small group or even right there at your microsite. How would an agent of the kingdom wrestle with God in this area of trust? Like, how do you wrestle with God when he's changing your assignment? Um, especially when you really liked your assignment. Uh, I love that about the military. The military is really good at reassigning personnel. Like, hey, you've been here three years or you've been here 18 months, time to go somewhere else. And our military members just do a fantastic job of leaning into that. Okay, well, new assignment, new unit, new culture, new role, new promotion. We have to change based on our assignment. How do we, how do we trust in God and, and seek him when we feel like we're being taken advantage of? When you feel like, uh, Riley, you don't know who I work for. Um, you don't know that I get passed over for promotion. You don't know that so-and-so takes credit of all the things that I do, or they turned in my assignment and submitted my work like it was their own. You don't know all that, Pastor Riley. No, I don't, uh, but I do know you can trust Jesus. So reflect on how do we trust him when you don't get the power or the job title or even when you feel powerless. Uh, I wore this jacket for another reason. Um, if you've been a part of our church, um, a couple years ago we did a sermon series called The Danger Zone. So we we're you know, playing with the whole Top Gun idea. And I got to share my testimony um, of taking a leap of faith, of stepping into the danger zone uh, when God really asked our family um, to get out of the military. That was not my plan. I had a great plan. We were gonna retire at 20. Um, I was gonna become a chaplain. Like, it was gonna be a great life. Uh, but God had better plans and he's been faithful. And so we took that step and I remember walking 
through my chain of command, basically what I had to do to turn down my promotion to E7 and um, turn down this assignment to Australia that I had, I had to go talk to my first sergeant, I had to talk to my senior enlisted advisor, I had to talk to my commander, then I had to talk to his commander, which was very awkward. Um, and every conversation I had, they're like, wait, you're going to separate from the military to go be a pastor at a church for what? Like, why don't you just do that later? I'm like, I know it is crazy, but it's what God asked me to do. And so every conversation, for the most part, I was being hit with like, well, what about this? Have you thought about medical coverage? What about retirement? And I had one great chief who said, Riley, this is God's calling for your life, man. What if you never get sick? What if God's going to be faithful? What if he's going to be exactly who he said he'd be? I would have missed out on the journey of a lifetime. I'm not going to sit here and say I wasn't afraid at moments, but I took that leap of faith. I, I stepped past fear and, and walked into the purpose that God had for me. Um, so as we wrap up this series, as we wrap up this message for today at least, um, I just want to encourage you there. God made you on purpose. He placed you there on purpose. He has you a part of Man of Church, even if this is your first time joining us for a service. You're here on purpose. And so if this is your assignment, if this is the local church you're supposed to be a part of, or you know the family you're in, you're made for your creator to be with him and to do good works. So in this moment, I just wanna encourage you um, by praying for you. So wherever you are right now, let's pray together. Um, God, we're just so in awe of who you are your plans, your, your dreams, your desires for us, the fact that you even think about us. I think of how David writes, or like what is man that you're mindful of him? Like, like who am I, who are we to know that the king of the universe, the, the, the creator thinks about us and you have plans and purpose for us. So in this moment, Holy Spirit, will you simply fill us afresh uh, give, give us the grace to see with eyes of faith what you're doing in us today. We don't want to be stuck in the past. Uh, we don't, we don't want to be crippled by or intimidated by the future. We want to rest in each and every step that you have for us each and every day. God, anoint us for our assignment. Uh, we, need, we need a touch from you, Holy Spirit, in order to be great employees of the kingdom. So anoint us for work. Um, if we're teaching, let us be amazing teachers as, as if Jesus himself were teaching that class. If we're commanders, may we have the authority that comes from the chief commander, the King of Kings, the Lord of Lords. God, use us to advance your kingdom here on the earth. In Jesus name. Amen. Now, if you could just do me one more favor. Um, we always close our services out with an invitation. Jesus would go and find lost people people who were desperate, people who were working, they had whole jobs. He would go and seek out people that were his. He would say two simple words, follow me. I think about all those moments in the Bible where I read people walking away from family, walking away from careers, from businesses, because Jesus, because God himself said, follow me. They laid down their lives and that's what he always asks us to do. If you're in that place where you hear God saying, hey, I need you to, to follow me. I, I know you're going through life. You're paying for your own sin. The good news is that while we were sinners, Jesus died for us. He's already paid for your sin. So you need to stop paying for it and follow him. If you're saying, yeah, Riley, that's, that's me. Like, I, I want to follow Jesus. I want to make him the Lord of my life. I want to be an employee of the kingdom of God. Or maybe you walked away from church. Maybe you walked away from Jesus. And in his faithfulness, he kept calling you. Um, do me a favor. If you want to respond to the gospel, if you want to make Jesus the center of your heart, the Lord of your life, and do me a favor. Right now in this moment, I want to pray with you. So if you just simply repeat after me and pray this prayer out loud, Jesus will save you. So Lord, we thank you. We say that we're sinners. Lord, we confess our sins. We repent and we choose you. Come into my heart, be the Lord of my life. Today is a new day, in Jesus' name, amen. 
Amen, man and family. We're so excited for all of you who may have prayed that prayer for the very first time. So if you prayed that prayer for the first time, we're so excited to celebrate with what God is doing in your life. And if you could let your microsite leader know, or if you're joining us online, let our team know right there in the chat that you made that decision to follow Jesus. We want to send you some resources and do whatever we can as your church family to help you follow Jesus. We love you. God bless you. And let's go change the world.